गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन एंड वेलकम टू दिस न्यू लेक्चर अंडर द सेम मॉड्यूल सो इन दिस लेक्चर वील डिस्कस अबाउट द थर्मोकेमिकल कन्वर्जन प्रोसेसेज लाइक टोरीफेक्शन एंड द कम्बशन सो इफ यू रिकॉल अवर डिस्कशन इन द प्रीवियस लेक्चर वी इनिशिएटेड अवर डिस्कशन अबाउट द थर्मोकेमिकल कन्वर्जन टेक्निक्स सो देर वी डिस्कस अबाउट द बेसिक्स ऑफ दिस पर्टिकुलर टेक्निक्स वेर एज इन दिस पर्टिकुलर लेक्चर वील डिस्कस अबाउट दिस इंडिविजुअल टेक्निक्स इन डिटेल सो फर्स्ट लेट अस सी अबाउट द टोरीफेक्शन so torrefaction is a thermochemical conversion process carried out in inert or limited oxygen environment so in this process biomass is slowly heated to within a specified temperature range so here the temperature range is specified and it retained there for a stipulated time period so that it results in near complete degradation of the hemicellulose fraction present in the biomass sample and while it maximizes the mass and the energy yield of the solid product so this is how the torrefaction process is converts the biomass into a solid product so in this particular process the temperature range is between 200 to 300 degree c so there is a very narrow temperature range is there for the torrefaction process because in this particular case if the temperature if it goes above this specified limit then what happens is like it results in the extensive devolatilization and carbonization of the polymers and both these particular steps are undesirable for the solid product formed during this torrefaction process moreover the loss of lignin in biomass is also very high if the temperature it goes beyond 300 degree c and if the loss of lignin is relatively high then it makes difficult to form the pellet from the product produced by this torrefaction process why it is so because the lignin in the biomass itself is act as a binder and then it binds the solid particles to form a solid pellets or the briquid in case if the lignin is volatilized or maybe the lignin is not present in the torrefied product then the formation of such a strong or the solid pellets is difficult moreover if you see the fast thermal cracking of the cellulose fraction it forms the tar and as a result this tar formation it start in the temperature range of 300 to 320 degree c there also a very small or narrow range is there for the cellulose degradation and if this particular temperature it shoot up relatively to a higher range then what happens is like the degradation of the cellulose starts and then it starts the tar formation and that is the reason the upper limit of torrefaction temperature it is fixed as 300 degree c and hence that is the reason that the torrefaction process also has a very small and the narrow temperature range the torrefaction is a important stage in the whole process as the bulk of depolymerization happens in this particular process and that's why it is called as a important stage moreover the depolymerization of the biomass it also takes place in a specific temperature range and also required a specific time period to allow this depolymerization to occur that's the reason the degree of torrefaction is very important so that it can be carried out in the specific temperature range and the material is allowed to retain for a specific time period in the torrefaction process so now let us try to understand what is this degree of torrefaction is so degree of torrefaction here if you see it depends on the reaction temperature as well as on the time when the biomass is subjected to the torrefaction process and it is shown here in the three different way for example the light torrefaction process so it occurs in the temperature range of 200 to only 240 degree c so to be precise here it carries out in the temperature range of around 230 degree c when only hemicellulose fraction of the biomass is getting affected whereas the lignin and the cellulose component remains unaffected during this particular process that's why it is called as a light torrefaction process and that is also called as a light degree of torrefaction whereas if you see the medium degree of torrefaction process here so in this case this process occurs in the temperature range of 240 to 260 degree c and exactly if you say it is about 250 degree c so in this process cellulose is mildly get affected and that's why it is called as a mild torrefaction process or mild degree of torrefaction last is the 
severe torrefaction process in this case the temperature is between 260 to 300 degree C or if you say the specific value it is 275 degree C is the specific temperature which is maintained during the severe torrefaction process. So, it characterized by if you see in this case depolymerization of the lignin cellulose as well as the hemicellulose fraction of the biomass compound and that is the reason as I said the narrow temperature range of the torrefaction is very crucial to get the efficient quality of the solid product. Now, if you see the torrefaction product in this case it gives the product in the form of solid, liquid and gas fraction. So, in the case of liquid if you see it is mainly a water organic lipids and if you talk about the solid product obtained during this process it is mostly a original and the modified sugar structure and new polymeric structure along with the ash and char. Whereas, the gases produced during these processes if you see it is the composition of these gases along with this also it forms the toluene and the benzene right. This is how the torrefaction production of solid takes place in this case the process is more toward the formation of the solid product. So, now once we understand this degree of torrefaction process now let us try to compare the torrefaction process with the carbonization because the torrefaction as well as the carbonization process is more or less similar but there is an important difference between these two processes similarly if we just try to compare these two processes with the pyrolysis process as well so you can easily differentiate between the torrefaction process carbonization and the pyrolysis process so let us see the important difference between these three processes if you look at the torrefaction process here it maximizes the energy and the mass yield with reduction in the O by C and the H by C ratio. So, what is the O by C is nothing but the oxygen to carbon ratio and H by C is the hydrogen to carbon ratio. Whereas, in case of carbonization process it maximizes the fixed carbon content and it minimizes the hydrocarbon content of the solid product while pyrolysis process it maximizes its liquid production and that is what is the pyrolysis process is known for it maximizes the liquid production to produce the bio oil. Now, another important difference between the torrefaction and the carbonization process is it retains most of the volatile and driving away only early volatilized low energy dense compounds and chemically bound moisture. Whereas, in case of the carbonization process it drives away most of the volatiles which are present in the biomass right. Whereas, in case of pyrolysis it is a complete de-volatilization process. So, this is how is the major difference between the torrefaction, carbonization and pyrolysis process. If you look at the another difference here it is in the form of the torrefaction process it requires relatively slow heating rate and that is so is with the carbonization process also it requires slow heating rate to get the solid product whereas, in case of the pyrolysis process the fast pace heating of the material is required to achieve the maximum liquid yield and that is what is mentioned here that it requires fast pace heating of the sample. So, that it can maximize the liquid yield in terms of the product. Moreover, in this particular process it tries to avoid the oxygen as well as the combustion during the process whereas, carbonization it takes place at a higher temperature and with certain level of the oxygen. Whereas, in case of pyrolysis it takes place at higher temperature and utilizes the partial oxygen so that it can supply the energy which is required for the process. So, this is the important difference again between these three processes. Moreover, the temperature range which is mentioned for the torrefaction process is little narrow that is in between the 200 to 300 degree C. Whereas, the carbonization process is carried out above the temperature of 300 degree C and it goes up to even 600 degree C. Similarly, the pyrolysis process it decomposes the material and the heating is above 300 to 400 degree C. It also goes up to 600 degree C as well. So, this is how is the important difference between the torrefaction, carbonization and the pyrolysis process and one important difference between the torrefaction and the carbonization process is the carbonization process it produces more energy dense fuel than the product produced by the torrefaction process, but it has much lower energy yield 
and that is what is the important difference between the carbonization and the torrefaction. So, now let us discuss about the another thermochemical conversion technique that is a combustion. So, thermochemical conversion process which is widely used at a commercial scale to produce the energy from the biomass is nothing but the combustion process and this is one of the most widely used commercial process where it utilizes the biomass to produce the energy and in this particular process the oxygen it reacts with the combustible substances right and it results in the formation of two stable product in the form of CO2 and H2O along with it also produces the heat. Now, if you see here the reaction which is shown here on the slide this particular C it represents the carbon content in the combustible solid fuel or maybe the liquid fuel it undergoes the combustion in presence of the oxygen and it produces the compound which is called as a oxidized compound CO2 and it releases significant amount of the energy this is kilojoule per mole of the carbon. So, when one mole of the carbon is burned in adequate air or the oxygen supply then it produces around 393 kilojoule amount of energy along with the CO2 and the H2O as a product. So, when we see this particular reaction this is called as a stoichiometrically balanced reaction because here if you see the one mole of C is reacting with the one mole of oxygen and then it is producing one mole of the CO2. The carbon in the product is also getting balanced in the carbon reactant and the oxygen here in the product is also getting balanced with the oxidizing agent which we have supplied for the oxidation purpose right. So, this is called as a stoichiometrically balanced equation and it is balanced on the basis of mole balance of the component. Now, the other combustion reaction which happens in the combustion process because of the oxidation of the hydrogen in the fuel to produce the steam. So, if you again see here this reaction this is the hydrogen it undergoes the combustion to produce water as a product that is H2 in the form of the steam here the H2 is in the form of the gas and then it produce around this much amount of the energy per mole of the hydrogen combusted in the combustion chamber. So, this is also a mole balance reaction which is we can say a stoichiometrically balanced equation because here if you see the 1 mole of hydrogen which is reacting again with the 0.5 moles of the oxygen it produces around H2O that is again the same right. So, 1 mole of oxygen is coming out from the product and here also the same and it releases significant amount of the energy. So, now this combustion reaction is often need to be balanced stoichiometrically to understand that whether the reaction is happening in the proper air to fuel ratio or not. So, what is meaning of the air fuel ratio that we will discuss in the subsequent slides. So, for the complete combustion of the fuel it takes place with significant amount of release of the energy. Apart from that the air requirement is more than the stoichiometric requirement for the oxidation reaction and that is what I mentioned in the case is like all these equations or the reactions are balanced stoichiometrically to understand that the complete combustion of the solid fuel or the liquid fuel is taking place in the combustion unit that is why it is producing the oxidized product in the form of CO2 and the H2O. But in practice it may not be so because in practice the oxygen required may be in excess of the stoichiometric requirement and that is the reason the particular stoichiometric equation need to be balanced for the actual combustion process as well just to find out what is the amount of oxygen or the oxidizing medium is required to allow the complete combustion to take place in the combustion chamber. Let us discuss about the combustion of the biomass. So, before we discuss about the combustion of biomass let us spend some time to understand that how this carbohydrate formation is taking place in the biomass or you can say in the plant material. This particular part we already discussed in one of the lecture. So, I am just repeating here once again just to make you aware that once this biomass is formed in the form of the carbohydrate molecules this particular carbohydrate molecules it undergoes the combustion process and as a result it forms the stable oxidized compound. Chemically the combustion is an exothermic reaction between the oxygen and hydrocarbon in biomass right. So, how this hydrocarbon formation takes place in the biomass because during the growth of the plant it absorbs the CO2 from the environment and water also along with that the radiant energy which is supplied in the form of solar radiation it also takes part into the photosynthesis process whereas the chlorophyll also present in the photosynthesis process by which it converts into a carbohydrate molecule which we are represented here in the form of the glucose 
and along with that it also produces the oxygen molecule and the carbohydrate molecules which form during this photosynthesis process it stores the chemical energy in the form of the chemical bond in this carbohydrate molecule and the chemical energy which is stored in this carbohydrate molecules it can be released by the combustion process so once this carbohydrate molecules undergo the thermochemical conversion process by the combustion mechanism it release significant amount of the energy along with the radiant and the kinetic energy so if you see here one simple example of the reaction scheme this represents the carbohydrate molecule obtained from the biomass and this is the oxidizing medium which is here shown as a oxygen and with some ignition temperature the combustion of the carbohydrate molecule takes place and it produce around x moles of co2 y moles of h2o and significant amount of the heat apart from that it also produces some other gases char and ash and that is what i said earlier if the combustion process is not a complete combustion so in that case it may produce even co and c as the product along with the co2 and the h2o because the co which is formed here it is a product of the incomplete combustion so this co it may react again with the oxygen to form the co2 and this char it may further undergo the oxidation process to form the co2 so likewise this particular kinds of products may form in practice whereas in theoretical we always consider it as a ideal condition and we consider that the entire fuel present in the combustion chamber is getting oxidized forming co2 and the h2o as a product along with that it also releases significant amount of the energy but in practice it may not be so because there may be a some uncombusted carbon present in the product along with that it may also release certain amount of the co which is a partly combusted mixture of the gas so this co as i said it can further undergo the oxidation reaction to form the co2 so likewise the combustion reaction need to be balanced based on the oxidizing medium used for the oxidation purpose in the combustion unit so once you understand this concept of the combustion of the biomass now let us try to see how this direct combustion of the biomass is takes place for example in the past the combustion of the biomass has been widely used to generate the heat and this is the regular practice in the past to generate the heat by combusting the biomass and this combustion process now it is making comeback in the many manufacturing industries to produce the electricity by combusting the biomass as a fuel and the straight forward conversion of thermal energy into the mechanical energy or the electrical energy results in the considerable losses during this particular process because it is not possible to raise the ratio of thermal to mechanical power above 60% but if the low temperature waste heat produced during this particular process can be used effectively for the drying and heating purposes so much higher overall efficiency can also be obtained so for that reason the heat produced during this particular process need to be effectively utilized for the drying and the heating purposes so that the overall high efficiency of the process can be obtained so this is the direct combustion of the biomass now if you see the direct combustion process here the fuel and the air mixture is burnt in the combustion unit to produce significant amount of the heat energy along with that it also produces the combustion product and radiant energy so air fuel ratio mixture is nothing but mass of fuel to mass of air ratio so this mixture of fuel and the air it oxidize or burn in the combustion chamber to produce heat energy combustion product and the radiant energy the simple equation which is represented here is fuel in presence of the oxidizing medium either oxygen which is a pure oxygen and the air it gives combustion product along with the energy and that also we have represented in the previous slide as well that combustion of carbon in presence of the oxygen it gives co2 as a completely oxidized product along with the significant amount of the energy now if you remember our discussion in one of the lecture regarding the combustibles of the solid carbon so the combustibles of the solid carbons are shared into two groups that is volatile matter
volatile matter and the combustible solid carbon present in the fuel. Whereas in this case, the share of the volatile matter present in the wood is typically high. Whereas the share of the solid combustible matter present in the wood is relatively low. So, 80 percent of the energy of the wood it generally originates from the combustion of the volatile matter or burning of the volatile matter. Whereas 20 percent of the energy it originates from the combustion or the burning of the solid carbon fuel present in the wood sample. And this is what is the difference between the combustion of the volatile matter and the combustion of the solid carbon present in the fuel. So, if you just try to understand this concept in more elaborate way, let us see the example of the burning of the wood sample here. So, it is burned in presence of the oxidizing medium that is air. So, during combustion as I mentioned the volatile component in the solid fuel it burns rapidly in presence of the oxidizing medium and these volatile components are nothing but the aromatic hydrocarbon long and the short chain hydrocarbon compound in the solid fuel. So, once this combustion takes place first this volatile matter rapidly takes part in the combustion process in presence of the oxidizing medium and then it forms this kind of the flaming behavior in the combustion unit. And because of this it also transfer the radiant energy to the wood along with that it also transfer the radiant energy to the surrounding and some forms of the conductive heat transfer is also takes place in the surrounding medium here. Whereas, the solid carbon which is present in the wood it takes part in the glowing combustion process. Whereas, the volatile matter present in the solid represents the flaming combustion behavior. So, let us try to understand these two concepts in more detail way using this particular schematic. So, if you see here the fuel which is again the solid fuel which is ignited in presence of the oxidizing medium here. So, the solid fuel as I mentioned it is mainly consist of 80 percent of the volatile matter and 20 percent of the solid carbon present in the wood sample. Then it undergoes the combustion process as a result the volatile matter it burn by the flaming combustion behavior whereas, the fixed carbon present in the wood it burns with the glowing combustion behavior and at the end it produces the flue gas as the product. While during this combustion the radiant energy produced it will get transferred some of the energy to the fuel wood whereas, some of the energy will get transferred to the surrounding along with that some heat conduction will also happen to fuel if it is a solid fuel as we have discussed the solid fuel example here. So, some heat conduction also happens to the fuel and then the product output is in the form of the heat, light and the radiation energy. So, this is how the combustion of the wood takes place in the combustion unit. So, now once you understand this particular combustion of the wood sample, now let us try to understand that how the properties of the combustion of the fuel is important. Why? Because if you are considering the combustion fuel as a solid, then the properties in the form of density, moisture content, volatile matter and the fixed carbon content is also important in this case. Apart from that the sulphur content, but most of the biomass does not have the sulphur, but there are some few specific biomass samples are there where it can find certain trace of the sulphur compound as well. Along with that it also depends on the ash and the calorific value of the biomass. Why it is so? Because if you look at this particular table here, it represents the fuel in the form of wood sample and then the fossil fuels. Now, if you just look at the biomass samples, the volatile matter contained in the biomass sample is significantly high that is in the range of say for example, here you can see the range here. Whereas, the volatile matter contained in the lignite and the anthracite coal if you see it is relatively low compared to that of the biomass. While the fixed carbon contained if you try to see in this table it is relatively less in the wood sample that is a biomass sample while the fixed carbon contained in the coal is significantly high. And that is the reason if the coal contains significantly higher amount of the volatile matter then it is beneficial for the ignition and the combustion process. Why? Because, because of the presence of high volatile matter in the combustion process and in the coal sample it relatively takes part in the combustion process as a result it will form the complete oxidized product of the carbon and even it will release significantly lower level of NOx during the combustion process. And that is what is the importance of the volatile matter in the solid fuel during the combustion process. Because as I mentioned 
the volatile matter present in the solid it contributes to the flaming combustion whereas the fixed carbon contained in the solid fuel it contributes to the glowing combustion process once we understand this combustion behavior of the solid fuel the flaming combustion and the glowing combustion is represented with the small pictures here so if you see the first picture it represents the flaming combustion so this kind of flames are formed because of the present of more volatile matter in the wood sample or you can say the solid fuel sample whereas if the fixed carbon content is high then this kind of glowing combustion appears in the combustion chamber so there won't be any flame because the volatile matter content in this particular sample is relatively less so as a result the formation of the flame will not happen in this particular process because the volatile matters as i mentioned they rapidly burn in presence of the oxygen so if the volatile matter content is relatively high so obviously the burning of the volatile matter will happen at a faster rate as a result there will be a formation of the flame if the volatile matter content is less what happen in that case is like such formation of the flame will not happen so this is how is the difference between the flaming combustion and the glowing combustion i think it is very much clear from this two picture now the biomass combustion it is a complex process and that consists of the heterogeneous and the homogeneous reaction why it is a homogeneous reaction as i said because when the biomass combustion is taking place in the combustion unit so there will be a some incomplete combustion will happen in the chamber as a result it may release co as a gas so this co which is a highly oxidizing agent it can oxidize in presence of the oxygen to produce again the co2 as a product so the reaction of co with the oxygen it is a gas phase reaction whereas the combustion of the solid and the char which are produced during the process with the oxidizing medium that is a heterogeneous reaction that is a solid gas heterogeneous reaction so likewise the biomass combustion it is a very complex process where heterogeneous as well as the homogeneous reaction appears consecutively and then it lead to a product the main process steps in this particular combustion process are drying devolatilization of the material then the gasification followed by the char combustion and then the gas phase oxidation and that's the reason i mentioned the gas phase oxidation is nothing but again the homogeneous reaction because both the gases are reacting in the same medium that is a gaseous medium that's why it is called as a homogeneous reaction of the gaseous mixture and the time used for each reaction it depends on the fuel size properties of the fuel the temperature selected and the combustion condition this is how this particular process it varies and it varies from the fuel to fuel as well as from the solid fuel from coal to the biomass as well because it all depends on the fuel size which is used for the combustion purpose along with that it also depends on the properties of the solid fuel which is used for the combustion purpose as i mentioned earlier it all depends on the volatile matter and the fixed carbon content in the solid fuel the temperature which is used for the combustion purpose is also very important and the combustion condition so now once we try to see this parameters these are need to be used very effectively to have the complete combustion of the solid fuel in the combustion unit in case if this kind of conditions are not maintained properly then different types of pollutants are generated from the complete and the incomplete combustion process so now let us see the difference between the complete and the incomplete combustion and the pollutant release from the complete and the incomplete combustion process so if you see this particular table we have already discussed in one of the lecture so in case of complete combustion if the sufficient amount of oxygen is supplied during the reaction the complete combustion will takes place as a result it gives of the non toxic product in the form of co2 that is a completely combusted product and the h2o again it is a completely combusted product along with the nox that is no and the no2 whereas in case of the incomplete combustion because of the incomplete combustion of the solid fuel in the combustion unit it gives off some polluting product that is in the form of it may form carbon dioxide which is a completely combusted product along with that it also form the co and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that is called as a pah and soot particle unconverted carbon will be there along with that the composition of the gas varying in this particular range will also get formed during the incomplete combustion of the biomass and this is how is the difference between these two processes so in practice we try to ensure that 
the reaction will reach to a complete combustion. So, this kind of polluting gases can be avoided during the combustion process. Apart from that, it also forms ash and the contaminant such as ash particle and the range of this kind of product as well. Clear? So, this is how is the difference between the incomplete and the complete combustion. So, once we understand this difference between the complete and the incomplete combustion, so now let us try to understand the combustion reactions taking place during the combustion of the solid fuel. For example, if you see here during combustion the molecules it undergoes the chemical reaction and the reactant atoms are rearranged to form new combination that is the oxidized product in the form of CO2 or the H2O and the reaction equation here it represents only the initial and the final results only and do not indicates the actual path of the reaction. It may involve some intermediate steps and the formation of some intermediate product as well. So, some fundamental reaction of the combustion mechanisms are shown here in the form of formation of the CO2 and the H2O. If the sulfur content is high in the solid fuel, take an example of the coal. If the sulfur content is relatively high in the coal, then it also releases this particular gas. So, these are some fundamental reactions of the combustion process. Now, after understanding the fundamental reaction of the combustion process, let us try to understand the this particular reaction in some more elaborate way. For example, if the combustion reaction is occurring in presence of the oxygen as a oxidizing medium, then the product formation will be in the form of only CO2 and the H2O. Whereas, if the air mixture is used for the combustion purpose, then along with the CO2 and the H2O, the nitrogen will also come out as it is from the combustion chamber. As per the ideal condition, as we consider that the nitrogen is not reacting in the process, so it will come out as it is without reacting into the combustion process. So, that will also add to the product. Along with that, it may also form some other product which are present in the hydrocarbon compound of the solid fuel. So, if the air is used as a oxidizing agent, so in that case, the combustion reactions are more complex because the air is used in combustion than the pure oxygen and if it is air is used then it will be accompanied by the nitrogen as well. Moreover, the fuel also consists of many elements such as carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, sulfur and the oxygen. The sulfur is present in some of the biomasses only, not all the biomasses has the sulfur component, but if it is a coal then obviously it will have the sulfur in its composition and then it will lead to a SO2 as a product because of the complete combustion again. And in addition to the complete combustion, as I mentioned earlier this point also, fuel also undergoes the incomplete combustion and that is what we have discussed in the previous slide that it may happen so in the practice that the fuel also undergoes the incomplete combustion as a result it will form the uncombusted product during the reaction. So, the composition of air if you just try to see for the combustion purpose, so it mostly consists of on the molar or volume basis is that is a dry air which is composed of 21 percent. So, we are represented here is like exact composition 20.9. So, it represents here like 20.9 percent oxygen, 78.1 percent is the nitrogen and remaining is traces of the other gases. For the good approximation purpose, we use molar volume of oxygen as 21 and nitrogen as 79. So, we neglect the traces of other gases during the stoichiometric balance or during the approximation. And thus, each mole of oxygen if you see here, it is accompanied by approximately 0.79 divided by 21 because there is a 79 percent of the nitrogen is accompanied by the 21 percent of the oxygen. So, in this case, oxygen is only the oxidizing medium whereas, in the ideal condition we consider that the nitrogen is not taking part into the reaction. So, it will come out as it is from the combustion chamber. So, as a result it is accompanied by around 3.76 moles of the nitrogen. So, 1 mole of oxygen is accompanied by around 3.76 moles of the nitrogen if air is used as a oxidizing medium. Clear? So, now based on this particular discussion if we just try to find out the theoretical air which is required for the complete combustion of the fuel to takes place and it results from the equation of stoichiometry of oxygen fuel reaction. 
So once you try to balance this particular equation, then you can easily find out theoretically the amount of oxygen which is required for the complete combustion of the fuel. If combustion of a stoichiometric mixture is complete, then in that particular case, the flue gas cannot have either a fuel or oxygen because we term it as a complete combustion. As a result, there won't be any incomplete product formation will take place. As a result, there won't be any oxygen which is left out in the combustion chamber, which is coming out as it is without oxidizing the fuel. As a result, if the oxygen is not coming out as it is, that means fuel is also getting completely oxidized in the combustion chamber and hence fuel also will not come out from the combustion chamber as a product. So, if you just try to balance one small stoichiometric equation of the biomass here, if you just try to see here, this represents the carbohydrate content of the biomass, it is reacting with the oxygen, this represents the air composition in the form of oxygen and 3.76 moles of the nitrogen. So, as I said, 1 mole of oxygen, it is accompanied by 3.76 moles of the nitrogen and for this particular complete reaction to happen, 6 moles of the air or you can say the air mixture is required for the complete combustion to take place and it will form 6 moles of CO2, this many moles of water and if you simply multiply 6 into 3.76, these many moles of nitrogen are coming out as it is from the combustion chamber without reacting into the combustion chamber. So, now if you just try to balance the carbon in this equation, so initially there are 6 carbon in the carbohydrate as a result 6 carbon dioxide molecules are coming out from the combustion chamber as a product and the air mixture it contains 6 moles of the oxygen and remaining moles of the nitrogen. So, 6 mole are oxygen already here and oxygen is already available in the hydrocarbon fuel also. So, these also need to be taken into account during the mole balance. If you see here, we have total 5 plus 12 that is 17 oxygen, carbon 6 and then hydrogen if you just count, we have 10 hydrogen in the reactant side. So, now we have to just balance this moles in the product as well. So, as a result, we got 6 carbon in the product, 10 hydrogen also in the product. Now, we have to just balance the oxygen. So, 6 into 2 that is 12 and 5 oxygen that means 17 oxygen. So, this is the stoichiometrically balanced equation and that is why it is called as a stoichiometric equation for the complete combustion of the biomass. And considering here, the oxygen has 21 percent in the air mixture and 79 percent is nitrogen. But in practice, for complete combustion to take place, air is always required in excess of the stoichiometric amount to ensure that the complete combustion of the solid fuel or the liquid fuel is taking place in the combustion chamber. And that is the reason we always try to ensure that the excess air is available in the oxidation chamber to allow the complete combustion of the fuel to take place. So, now based on this particular stoichiometric, if you just try to discuss the stoichiometry and the air fuel ratio, as I mentioned, the air fuel ratio is nothing but the mass of mass of fuel to the mass of air that is called as a fuel to air ratio or we can also term it as a air to fuel ratio in other terms. So, the stoichiometric quantity of the oxidizer which is required for the complete burning a quantity of the fuel that is termed as a stoichiometric combustion and this amount of fuel and the air which are taking part in the combustion process are often expressed as air to fuel ratio and that is what I mentioned here is like this is very important to understand that how the particular combustion of the fuel air mixture is taking place in the combustion chamber. The stoichiometric oxidizer that is either oxygen or the air to fuel ratio is determining by writing the simple mole balance equation and assuming that the fuel reacts to form a ideal set of product. So, for example purpose, let us take one example of the hydrocarbon fuel which is normally represented in the form of C x and 
H Y and the stoichiometric relation for this particular fuel can be expressed in the following way. So, let us see how to express this particular hydrocarbon fuel in the stoichiometric way to have the complete combustion of this particular fuel in the combustion chamber. So, now if you see here the combustion stoichiometry of a hydrocarbon fuel. So, it is represented as C U H W. So, this is the hydrocarbon which is available for the combustion purpose and it is oxidized using the pure oxygen and the number of moles of oxygen required is mentioned here right and then it gives y moles of CO2 and z moles of H2O as a product. So, now if you just try to first balance the carbon, hydrogen and the oxygen in the reaction. So, for balancing the carbon if you see here there is this many atoms of carbon are there. So, y is equal to u there is no other carbon which is getting formed during this particular reaction. Apart from that if you just try to balance the hydrogen again. So, this is the hydrogen which is present in the hydrocarbon and it is forming z moles of H2O. So, if you just try to balance this. So, this w is equal to 2 z that is twice of z mole and hence z can be written in the form of w by 2. So, this is a simple mole balance of the hydrogen also we have done and now for the oxygen if you see here the 2 n and then we have 2 y in the product along with the 1 z as well right. So, this is the mole balance you can say for the oxygen. Now, you just simplify this equation and you will get the equation in the form of n is equal to u plus w by 4. So, if you just substitute this value in the previous equation that is equation 1 suppose here. So, it forms this is a hydrocarbon it requires this much moles of oxygen to form the stable compound and to have the complete combustion of the fuel in the combustion chamber right or I would say in the other term is like this much moles of oxygen are required to completely oxidize the hydrocarbon fuel to produce the CO2 and the H2 as a compound along with the significant amount of the heat. So, it is important here that for one mole of fuel that is represented here as like this there is a necessary exactly to have this many moles of oxygen for the complete combustion. So, this is one of the simple way to represent this that for this one mole of hydrocarbon fuel it requires this many moles of the oxygen so that the complete combustion of the fuel will takes place in the combustion chamber. So, now based on this we can easily find out like how to calculate now the air to fuel ratio for the specific solid fuel. Why it is required? Because as I mentioned when we are burning a fuel in the oxidizing medium so it is a air fuel mixture now. So, as a result the air fuel mixture is getting oxidized in the combustion chamber and forming the oxidized product along with the significant amount of the heat. Once this particular combustion process is taking place in the combustion unit, so the combustion process it all depends on the supply of the oxygen in the combustion chamber. If the supply of the oxygen in the combustion chamber if it is not sufficient then it may lead to a incomplete combustion. If the supply of the oxygen is relatively high then it will have complete combustion along with that it may also add some oxygen in the product as well because the supply of the oxygen is in surplus. So, as a result to have the complete combustion process and to balance the equation that is called as a stoichiometric equation the exact amount of the oxygen also can be calculated from the mole balance of the fuel and that is termed as a stoichiometric equation or stoichiometric oxygen which is required for the combustion purpose and based on that the amount of the excess air required for the combustion purpose also can be calculated that is called as a air to fuel ratio and if this particular ratio is calculated for the stoichiometric uh, equation similarly for the actual process it can also be calculated considering the same fuel. So, that is called as a equivalence ratio which is the ratio of the stoichiometric quantity of the air to fuel ratio divided by the air to fuel ratio which is actually required for the combustion of the solid fuel in the combustion chamber. So, before discussing on the equivalence ratio let us first discuss about the what is mean by the air to fuel ratio. So, for the simplicity purpose if you just simplify the combustion of the fuel in presence of the air then as I mentioned 
it will be having 21 percent of the oxygen and it will be accompanied by the 79 percent of the nitrogen if the air is as a oxidizing medium and for that reason each mole of oxygen in air is accompanied by 3.76 moles of the nitrogen. So, if you just replace this particular equation in the form of now hydrocarbon fuel and instead of using the oxygen as a oxidizing agent here we are considering oxygen plus accompanied nitrogen molecules in the air. So, this is a air mixture now and this many moles of air are required for the combustion process to occur or I would say for the complete combustion of the fuel to takes place. It will result into u moles of CO2, w by 2 moles of H2O that balance we already done in the previous slide and 3.76 n is the moles of nitrogen just multiply 3.76 into n. So, this many moles of nitrogen will come out as it is from the combustion unit. So, now if you just try to find out the air to fuel ratio for this stoichiometric balance equation. So, air to fuel ratio stoichiometrically that is why it is mentioned here the stoichiometrically it is calculated as the mass of air this is a mass of air and that is the reason if you remember in the previous slide I wrote the ratio as even fuel to air ratio as mass of fuel to the mass of air because here we are considering the balance of the equation in terms of the mole balance or you can say the volume basis. But while calculating the air to fuel ratio we are calculating in terms of the mass ratio. So, we need to convert this particular moles into the mass first. So, if you talk about the mass of air and then the mass of fuel which is a stoichiometric quantity which is required for the complete combustion to take place. So, the mass of air is now here is like 3.76 moles of nitrogen 1 mole of the oxygen that is equivalent to 4.76 into n this is the moles of air which is required for the combustion and molecular weight of the air divided by the moles of fuel that is the hydrocarbon here it is 1. So, 1 into molecular weight of the fuel that is the hydrocarbon in the particular equation. So, once you multiply this value you will get here the air to fuel ratio for the particular stoichiometric equation that is the mole balance equation which you have set for the specific hydrocarbon in the form of this right. So, this is the exact quantity of the air mixture which is required for the complete combustion of this fuel to produce CO2 and the H2O as a product right. That is why it is called as a stoichiometric air to fuel ratio. Similarly, in practice or you can say in actual the amount of oxygen which is required for the combustion it may be high or even it may be lesser than the stoichiometric amount. It all depends on the properties of the fuel as we have discussed in the previous slide. So, if the actual amount of the air which is required for the combustion purpose is even higher or lower than the stoichiometric amount then this particular amount is represented by the equivalence ratio and it is the ratio of air to fuel ratio of stoichiometric amount to the air to fuel ratio of the actual reaction. And if you just rearrange this it will lead to a form of like fuel to air ratio that is actual to the fuel to air ratio stoichiometrically required for the complete combustion to takes place. Let us try to understand this concept in more simpler way. For example, if the equivalence ratio is 1 in that case what happens is like the fuel to air ratio which is required for the actual reaction it is same as that of the fuel to air ratio which is required for the stoichiometric equation as well. That is the reason here the phi is equal to 1 that means the exact amount of the oxygen is required for the combustion of the specific amount of the fuel and it is also matching with the stoichiometric quantity of the fuel requirement as well as the oxygen requirement for the combustion purpose. In case if this particular phi value if it is less than 1 in that case what happens is like it is considered as the fuel in mixture because from this ratio if you just try to see the phi value is less than 1. What does it mean? The fuel which is available for the combustion purpose is less than that of the oxygen which is available for the combustion purpose. That is why it is called as a fuel in mixture 
or in the other term it is called as a oxygen rich or oxidizer rich mixture right now in other way if this particular phi if it is greater than 1 then in that case you just try to substitute the value which is greater than 1 here in that case it may happen so that the fuel which is available for the oxidizing purpose in the combustion unit which is significantly higher than the oxygen which is supplied for the combustion purpose or the air which is supplied for the combustion purpose that's why it is called as a fuel rich mixture whereas here it is a fuel lean that means lower amount of the fuel is available for the combustion purpose whereas the oxygen is higher and other word we can term it as a oxidizer rich mixture whereas in this case the fuel is available in the significantly higher amount than that of the oxidizer which is supplied in this particular combustion unit as a result it is called as a fuel rich mixture or in other word is a oxygen or oxidizer lean mixture so it is very much clear now how to find out the fuel rich and the fuel lean mixture from the particular equation so now after understanding the concept of the solid fuel combustion in the combustion chamber let us try to extend our discussion for the combustion of the hydrocarbon which is another kind of hydrocarbon but it also has a oxygen in its composition whereas if you see the previous example there we have seen that it is a pure hydrocarbon where there is no oxygen present in the hydrocarbon as a solid fuel whereas in this case the hydrocarbon it also contains the oxygen in its composition and when you are burning this particular fuel in the same amount of the air mixture right it produce co2 this many moles of co2 and h2o along with nitrogen as a product and also it releases significant amount of the heat but in this case while balancing the oxygen we need to take into account the oxygen which is present in the solid fuel as well then only we will come to know the exact oxygen which is required for the combustion purpose and it also matches to the stoichiometric balance of the oxygen in the equation so if you try to see here now this equation and if you just try to balance again the moles of carbon hydrogen and the oxygen so we already done this exercise in the previous slide so i will just do here for the oxygen just to make you understand that if there is a oxygen present in the solid fuel itself so how to balance the moles of oxygen in the reaction so if you see here there is a x mole of oxygen which is already present in the solid fuel and then we have two moles of oxygen in the air mixture which is resulting into the two moles of oxygen which is getting combined with c to form co2 and then w by 2 again is coming from the h2o right so once you balance this and then calculate the value we will get the n in the form of u plus w minus 2x by 4 so this is nothing but the moles of air which is required if the oxygen is present in the solid fuel so this is slightly different than the previous mole balance equation because in that case there was no oxygen present in the hydrocarbon fuel now simply just substitute this n value in this equation here so you can see that this is the hydrocarbon fuel and these many moles of air which is required for the complete combustion to take place and it will lead to a product and then amount of the heat so this is called as a stoichiometrically balanced equation for the hydrocarbon where the oxygen is present in the hydrocarbon fuel itself right so once you understand this stoichiometric balance or the mole balance of the component stoichiometrically then you can find out the air to fuel ratio for any kind of fuel either it can be a methane propane butane or gasoline even you can easily find out the air to fuel ratio so after learning the combustion process now let us discuss about the application of this combustion process for example as i mentioned the combustion process is making a comeback in many industrial application including the generation of the electricity so apart from this production of the electricity the combustion process also has application in the this particular field it also has application in the ic engine that is the combustion of fuel in the engine boiler that is the combustion of the solid fuel to produce the heat and the subsequently the heat produced from the boiler can be used as a process it for the manufacturing purpose apart from that it can be also used to produce the steam 
and in the steam engine steel industries where significantly high temperature is required so the combustion process is widely used in the steel industries okay apart from that the domestic heating which is a very well known example and the brick cleans apart from that there are many more applications are there for this particular technique so now in this particular lecture we learn about the torrefaction as well as the combustion process in detail so in the next lecture we will discuss about the other thermochemical processes thank you regarding this lecture if you have any doubt so feel free to contact me at vvgoud@iitg.ac.in